everybody, my name's Chris. I am the content creator for Tiny Home Tours. Right now, you are actually in the schoolie that I am building right now. This is gonna be my full-time home for the goal is the next 10, 15 years, building it to be off the grid. But anyways, I have a website called schooliegear.com. Uh, in today's video, you're gonna hear about the Nature's Head composting toilet. I am a distributor. If you are interested in purchasing a Nature's Head composting toilet, I also send you the peat moss. I send you two bags of peat moss from Amazon whenever you place your order. And also 5% of net profits per month are donated to a schoolie build, a tiny home build, a van build, and you know, it just helps the community. And also you get free peat moss with your order and then I'm able to put some of that cash to build my own schoolie. So thank you so much for watching today's video. Uh, I always check out the comments, so I do appreciate everybody commenting. If you have any questions for me, leave it in the comments down below, and enjoy today's video. Well, my name is James Mock, and uh, my fiance and I built this rig from the ground up. Her name's Bertha. She's built on a 1970 International Lodestar chassis, and we started from there. My fiance and I, when we were early in our relationship, one of the things that we bonded over was the fact that we both dreamed of having a, an antique car, like a Sunday driver, so to speak. So then I ended up scooping up a 1963 Ford F100 regular cab pickup truck that had 55,000 original miles on it, no paint left, all rust patina, but uh, a sound mechanical rig. And we had that for eight or 10 months and that was our Sunday driver. And I also used it for contracting work as a second, uh, second work vehicle. And then when we decided to go, uh, go tiny house, we realized we needed a bigger rig and we discussed um, the different options, whether it was gonna be a bumper pull or a fifth wheel or kind of a modified class C, you might call it, I guess. And for me, this was kind of a no-brainer way to go because the having a $40,000 tow rig was was not really appealing to me. And then, then you're a trailer and you're in a gray area as a tiny house, so like that works in some ways, but it also doesn't work in others. I mean, insurance is hyper easy for me because it's just an antique vehicle. So I can insure an antique vehicle both for liability with a call, a phone call, and for a premium that's established with any hot rod or antique company. So it kind of doesn't matter what it is, we just both agree on the value. So even though it's not a registered motor home, that was sort of a compromise for me there. And yeah, I just wanted it to be able to move. I didn't want to pay $1,000 a day to have a towing company pull me around. I wanted to be able to move when I wanted to, but I also didn't want to buy a, a shiny new diesel. So ironically, I have a uh, not so shiny old diesel now, but I didn't have it when I built this, so it came after. So yeah, we decided we were gonna sell the Ford. And I put it on Craigslist and it sat there for a little while and nobody really offered me what I thought it was worth. So I got creative and I said, well, somebody who has what I want might want what I have. So I just wrote up a bio for the truck and I started looking online for the truck I wanted and then emailing them and saying, here's what I have, you have what I want, would you consider a trade or a partial trade? And I just sent out that blanket email to 30 or 40 different people from Kansas to Nebraska to Wyoming to New Mexico to Utah, all around Colorado, anybody that had what I was interested in working with. And uh, fortuitously, this guy in Fort Morgan, which is only just over an hour away, called me and said, yeah, I bought it because I thought I could sell it, but it sat on my lot for a year and nobody bought it. So if that Ford will drive out here, I'll trade you on the spot, no questions asked. And uh, two hours later, I was driving home in a new International, new to me. It didn't look 
like it does now. I painted it as well. I was really intimidated by that. I wanted to procrastinate it by my nature and not paint it till later. But there's kind of a no going back point once you build a house over the top of it and that makes it more challenging. So I bit the bullet and uh, learned a new skill there. That's for sure. Come on in. All right, so we're inside. Yeah, you know, we'd say probably about 85% of the materials used in this build were reclaimed materials. So whether it was something I got for free from a job that I worked in as a contractor to something that I found for free on Craigslist to something that I bought at a discounted rate from a supplier because it was, you know, seconds or damaged or what have you. We tried to use the lesser desired materials of the world, which when we started, that was our goal, was just to build something with what's available. We saw a documentary on Netflix about a guy who built a tiny home, but he built everything from Home Depot, bought everything from Home Depot. And as a contractor, all I said as a response to it was, that doesn't make any sense because you shouldn't be buying all these brand new materials to build a tiny home. A tiny home can be built out of all the scraps and the leftovers and the overages from the wasteful commercial building that we already do. So that was our initial inspiration right off the bat was let's build something with the extras, the bent crookeds and the cutoffs in the dumpster. And when you tile a floor, you overage by 20%, but then you probably don't use that extra 20%. And it turns out 20% of a thousand square feet is 200 square feet, which is more than I need for anything in here. So it's just out there. And it's usually, as we learned in the process, nicer materials. So when we started, it was all just recycled. And I kind of imagined I was going to source somehow not brand new, you know, finished grade plywood and just do a very basic interior. And through the process, as I was looking for framing materials and sheathing and roofing and all that jazz along the way, I just kept coming across exotic hardwoods and stuff like that. And I, I can't turn down free Brazilian cherry. It's something I have, I don't know, but Brazilian cherry is beautiful. Mahogany is beautiful. If, if it's around and nobody else is using it and sees the value in it, I will happily absorb that and make it. So, you know, as you walk through our home, almost everything I can point to has a story and is reclaimed from somewhere or other. You know, Brazilian cherry is a, a repetitive theme throughout this build, even though there isn't really a theme. That's kind of the beauty of it. But um, I met some folks who had a beautiful high end mid century modern home in South Denver that was in a really prime location. And their plan was to completely demolish it and rebuild something newer and more modern in its place. So they had a pre demolition whole house sale and I showed up to it and uh, I bought a granite countertop and then I worked out a deal as a contractor with them because I needed somebody to help with the other people removing stuff. And it was the beginning of a relationship. So by the time everybody had cleared out what had been purchased from that sale, they gave me free wrap up rain on the whole house and said, anything that's left here, you can have it. If you want to take it out, use it, repurpose it, sell it yourself on Craigslist, whatever you want to do, please take it. Don't let it go to waste. And there was 1800 square feet of solid Brazilian cherry flooring in that house. Actually, ironically, it's not the flooring. Um, it's every other Brazilian cherry, which I'll point out, it's kind of buried everywhere. The stairs are solid Brazilian cherry from that you know, as are the steps up to the loft. And then it gets a little more creative, the divider pocket door to the loft. This is all flooring that I took and ripped the tongue and groove off of and then planed down the top and the bottom and then edge glued it and clamped it and made paneling. So I used Brazilian cherry paneling for a lot of my cabinetry building and for a lot of other stuff for the butcher block countertop, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, the Brazilian cherry is definitely a, a prevalent theme. We have some Hawaiian koa here. We call this the office area. We sort of were a little conflicted about in this small of a space where we were going to put a cool pull out desk that we could pay bills at and uh, do computer work. But then it involved having a folding chair that went with it. So that way we could sit at the, pull out desk and it just got complicated. And I 
struggled with it for far too long and there wasn't a spot where it seemed like it would fit. So eventually we just made a standing height desk here. So I can put my laptop on top of this countertop and my arms are at the, the right angle. It's a compromise between myself and my fiance because she's 5'3". But um, yeah, this is our, our office space here. And it's also kind of our entry table. It gets things dumped on it a little more often than I'd like, but it's a convenient space to have. Yeah, so this area, this is just really more of our landing area. We've got, you know, shoe cubbies over here. And then over here, we've got spot for my fiance and I to dump our water bottles, hang our keys, hang a rain shell when we come in when the weather's that way, you know, an extra layer. Hats always end up on those hooks for me. Just uh, because flat spaces tend to accumulate clutter and we have a limited amount of flat spaces, they tend to get used you know, almost on the hour. So you can't really count on dumping the things on a flat space that you normally would dump and then leaving them there because that space is gonna be essential to cooking or office really quickly. It, that's what it's all about. It's all about organization and systemizing and nothing gets left out and everything has a place. That's the only way that you keep your sanity in a space this small. So with the bathroom, uh, you know, everything in life is some level of compromise. And also uh, anyone who's ever certainly built a full-size home from scratch, but you know, even owned a home of your own. It's kind of a never ending series of projects. So done is a relative term, you know, by the time you're ever maybe done, you're probably ready to remodel. So I chose to work with these reclaimed uh, panel doors as opposed to having to frame in walls just because they were lighter and they served an aesthetic and a structural purpose all in one. And I do have a third one still as well. So the way I made the steps up to the loft, there is a space. So initially there was, you know, a, a plan of having a sliding barn door there because we didn't definitely didn't want a swinging door. There isn't room for that. But yeah, admittedly, it's just sort of way down on the, the potential projects list. And um, the whole tiny home living thing is wonderful. And my fiance and I love it. And even though we're not doing it currently, we're excited to do it again in our lives. And one of the best things about it was how it made us grow closer together. And there's all sorts of pretenses that we carry when we interact with other people, even in our you know, personal relationships. And we definitely broke down a bunch of those barriers through living in a space this small and you know, using a restroom with only a, a fabric divider. And it, it's not a big deal. It's just part of the, the whole, embracing shedding uh, the imposed weights of society kind of you know you realize in, in some cultures people sleep 10 people in a room and i couldn't imagine doing that that seems outlandishly crazy to me but living in a space this small that's comfortable and uh and ergonomic and and made with that purpose doesn't seem crazy or outlandish to me at all yeah there's some level that this might turn into a slider someday but we thought we were going to hate it and it was going to be a real short-term compromise and it became such a non-issue that it's just stayed. Yeah, so we have a nature's head composting toilet, which we love wholeheartedly. We did a bunch of research and it was definitely a hang-up point for my fiance even more than myself as to what we were going to do. So we just dug into the knowledge train and um, unfortunately I can't remember their YouTube channel off the top of my head, but this uh, younger couple who has a nice coach RV that they've modified to be a little bit greener and more environmental and they have uh, a nature's head composting and they did some reviews of it. And those were really influential in our decision making process down to the, the blind nose sniff test of a bucket of dirt compared to a 30 day nature's head composting toilet and uh, it passing that nose test, that was a uh, nail in the coffin for us. So we, we took the leap. They're a little bit more expensive than some other options, but they seem to have covered all their bases. And again, we love it. We, we really do. I think within the first couple of weeks of it, the conversations went something like, how come every house in America isn't using a nature's head composting toilet instead of wasting potable drinking water to flush a toilet? And then think about, you know, waste treatment plants and how, you know, toxic and biohazardy gross of a situation that that creates where, 
you know, your liquid waste is sterile and your solid waste is compostable, especially if you remove the excess moisture from it. And you just use a tiny bit of science and thinking and it's spectacular. We've brought it on car camping trips with us just to ease that use. And I think everybody should have a nature dead composting toilet. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly endorse them. And so does my fiance. And she's definitely a little bit, um, a little bit pickier than I am with cleanliness and things like that. And she's still all for it. You do have to adjust your mindset, but it's a minimal adjustment and it's rewarding. And I think that probably just about everybody could do with a little bit of that for the greater good. Yeah, talking about the shower kind of brings us down a whole rabbit hole of backstory. We knew that there was a lot of extra materials available out there and Craigslist has always been a friend of mine. So I dove deep into Craigslist free, but I'm also a contractor. So I'm also always giving things away on Craigslist. And when I'd see something I liked on Craigslist, I'd call them and they'd say 30 people already called and I'd go shucks. I lost it. But then I'd put something on Craigslist and 30 people would call but nobody would show up. Nobody would, nobody has a, a stake in free. So they just won't show up. It's a, a theoretical thing more than it's a realistic thing. So I started calling and when people would say, oh, five or eight people have already called before you. I'd say, listen, they're not gonna show up. I promise you they're not. When they don't, don't go down your whole list. Call me, I'll show up, I'll set a time. I'll be there five minutes before the time that I set and I'll take it. And people started calling me back and saying, you know, you're right. They didn't show up and the next person didn't show up. So will you please just show up? So that was a huge breakthrough in Craigslist of us successfully acquiring stuff. And then we decided to just, you know, get a little bit more assertive. I almost said aggressive, but I think it was just assertive. And we just put out an ad. We did it in the material section, I think primarily, but also in the free section, which I'm not endorsing because it's against the Craigslist terms. They don't, there's a wanted section that's for that. Unfortunately, people don't just sit at home all day saying, I wonder if anybody wants my stuff. I'm going to go look. So the wanted section is a little bit of a dead end. So we got assertive with it and we just put wanted ads in the material section and in the free section, hoping that people who were considering listing stuff would be browsing it as well. And we just put a couple of pictures of ourselves and a picture of my VW camper van I built and you know, a little paragraph bio of who we are, what we were trying to do, what our goals of like conservation and reuse were and just sort of summing it up with, my dad has all this stuff in his garage on the East Coast because it's too good to throw away, but he doesn't have a use for it. So it's just sitting there. There's, I'm sure there's people around here in the same boat and I'm just gonna put in front of you that I've got a use and a need for it and I can put it to good use and I'm reliable. And it was almost a full-time job. I. I seriously considered starting a reclaimed and recycled materials business based on the level of feedback that I got. And people would come say, oh yeah, I've got these windows that you said you needed. So I'd go to look at them and then they'd say, oh, well, I also have this box of nails and I also have this roll of tar paper and I also have this flashing. And they'd just be rattling off these things. And I'd say, well, I can use that and that, but I, can't really come up with a use for that and that right now. And then they just look at me and go, can you take it anyways? So I just started accumulating building materials uh, based on the fact that they're too good to throw away. And uh, yeah, it was, it was inspiring and encouraging. And I think in this particular American culture, there isn't enough of a focus and a respect for people that are willing to adapt and use something secondhand. Everybody wants everything to be brand new, perfect, clean, manufactured and packaged for them. And uh, there's a lot of other cultures where, you know, everybody builds off of layers of trickle down and recycling. And man, if they could see what is in our dumpsters, they would start crying. It's amazing what, what people throw away that's so usable here can build entire houses. We put up this Craigslist ad saying what we wanted and got tons and tons of feedback. And I mean, I wish I had a, a list in front of me to give a shout out to all the amazing people that donated individual or multiple items to help us create this dream. But um, 
one particular gentleman had a high-end luxury motor coach that he bought at a at an auction because it had serious water damage so i think the figures are something along the lines of it was built in 99 and sold for five hundred and fifty thousand dollars it was a diesel pusher it was beautiful and then he bought it at an auction with water damage for nineteen thousand dollars and his goal was like a little bit more of a, a bare bones, more like a hunting cabin. They call it like a dry cabin. So you don't have plumbed appliances. You use a camp stove and you use coolers and you use water jugs. And he wanted bunk beds for him and his son and his son's friends to go camping and to have like a no frills kind of a, an experience. He also, he had to gut it to remove the mold and water damage in the first place. So he contacted me and said, it looks like you obviously have some mechanical and carpentry skills and I've got some stuff that's probably pretty useful to you that I just need to get out. So he, you know, I met with him and we came to an agreement and then he actually drove the motor coach to my house where I was working and stayed there for a full day. And we pulled out this uh, single piece fiberglass shower stall uh, from his motor coach. We also pulled out the side-by-side -side double door propane and 110 refrigerator. It was super, super fortunate. I mean, that alone, they're $2,500 used and $4,000 new. And it's the biggest one I've ever seen. So I, every time I walk in here, I reflect on how fortunate I am that that wandered into my life. And then lastly, he also um, gave us a fold down futon. You know, I didn't have as much tiling experience when I did this a couple years ago. And yeah, I probably would be comfortable now with using just a polymer flexible grout. And uh, I think that that's a, a solid endorsement, but I was super concerned about, you know, mortar breakdown and tiles falling off the wall and causing damage. So I went with a hundred percent silicone uh, both as the mastic and as the grout, which is considerably more labor intensive to install, especially the grouting. Because if you've ever tried to clean up the edge of a silicone bead, it seems like an almost never ending game. Um, but I just, I got a technique down and I, just, I siliconed all the, their porcelain uh, artificial slate tiles, which I wanted something stable and uniform as well. And, you know, semi lightweight, they're not, they're not hyper lightweight, but there's also not that much square footage of it. Yeah, and I would say like maybe the bathroom is probably the place where there's the most intention for, I call it like phase one and phase two and phase three. As you, as you conceptualize something like this, it's really unrealistic that you're gonna do it all in one go before you ever use it. So then it's like, okay, where, what's gonna get us to a point where this is comfortable enough to use and live in? And then what's the next step of our, almost our first remodel? So yeah, we touched on the fact that there's potentially a slider door in the future here. There's also, it's built, just not installed. There is a divider for up here that has two louvered cabinet doors installed into it. So you have the option to open and close the, the louvers. There is a wired um, inline vent fan for, to remove excess moisture. That being said, I think that we could probably count on one hand the number of times that we both showered in the shower. And that's because we have an outdoor shower built on the outside and we've never lived in it in the dead of winter. We lived in it in Oregon in the fall, but it was still warm enough that a crisp air and nice hot water from the outdoor shower and then it doesn't even go into my gray water tank it just goes right into the ground we use the outdoor shower right now i'm remodeling the bathroom in the basement of our house so it's out of commission and we're just using the outdoor shower on the tiny house in our yard full time as our shower because we love an outdoor shower it's, it's wonderful so yeah do something that's uh, functional and practical. Don't get over luxurious maybe with your indoor shower and then make sure you treat yourself to an outdoor shower. For our domestic hot water, we have an on-demand tankless hot water heater, um, a propane unit, and we have hard plumbed propane run through the entire, the entire house to fuel that. So 
heating is a is a good topic and one that I, I've only sort of uh, answered completely. When I built the home, I plumbed in PEX radiant heated uh, floor tubing all through the the floor decking. So we have two zones. We have the main floor and we have the loft as separate zones. And those are plumbed, but they're not connected to anything right now. Um, we had two different sort of thoughts. The easier one is a second propane tankless hot water heater with a closed loop and a recirculating pump and just set up to a thermostat. Along the way, we definitely had aspirations of being able to not only live off grid, but live like really low expense. And um, another point in my life when I was living in a different camper van, I spent an extended time living in the national forest and just moving from national forest to a national forest and not breaking the rules, but uh, using the system maybe the way it was intended to be that you can't stay put, it's yours to use. And uh, there's pretty much limitless free firewood in the national forest. So yeah, we definitely had in the back of our mind that if we couldn't find a good place to park permanently, that we would just embrace a boondocking life and live in the national forest and bounce around and it's essentially free, but heating in the wintertime in the national forest could be considerable, but there's limitless firewood. So a different hypothetical solution was a water jacketed external wood stove that would just be plumbed into the radiant floor and would just circulate, you know, heated water through the floors from the wood stove because wood stoves inside of small spaces like this seem to be kind of a losing battle. I've stayed in plenty of smaller cabins with wood stoves, but it's either a cook and freeze cycle or it's a wake up every two hours on the max, which really interrupts your sleep cycle. So I, I was never really interested in putting a wood stove inside. We definitely would love to have an exterior wood stove, but also just being able to run off propane with the tankless is pretty dang efficient. Our tankless hot water heater, our on-demand system is an EcoTemp. So it's a pretty basic low-end unit. I think we sourced it off of Amazon for $120 or hundred. I think actually the smallest unit that they make that we could have used was 110. And I think we went with the second stage up of volume, which was 180 or $190. And it's worked out, you know, pretty well for us. There's definitely a little bit of a learning curve to the on-demand change. And, you know, I've experienced with some of like my higher end contracting jobs for other homeowners. If you really invest in a high end on-demand system, you don't feel it at all. There's, there's no, no sacrifice or adjustment at all. That being said, in my experience, those all require 110 maintenance uh, voltage, which was something I wanted to avoid just for like long-term boondocking and having a maybe a minimal solar array and being battery powered. I have a 3000 watt inverter and I do have, you know, 120 plugs wired throughout the house. So they are there and available, but it's more of a, if you need it, we can turn on the inverter remotely from inside and you can use it. And then I turn it back off because it's got fans running and it's just using energy all the time. So I didn't want any of my systems to require 110 to maintain themselves. So in retrospect, that's definitely been a serious challenge, but I think that it's worth it because I can go anywhere and I don't lose any of my systems while I just run off of 12 volt batteries. Absolutely. Everything that I built into it works. Yeah, so for lighting, it's all, um, you know, surface mounted puck LED lights. Again, I think I sourced those off of Amazon. Amazon Prime was my friend for a lot of the the small 12 volt electrical stuff. I'm from the East Coast and there there's West Marines and even secondhand Marine shops everywhere. But out here in Colorado in the middle of the country, it's not the same. So my resources were a little limited on that front. So I just had to, you know, go with where I could find it. And I didn't want to spend an arm and a leg, but I wanted to make sure I got decent quality stuff. And with LEDs, it's also pretty safe because you're working with hyper, hyper low amperages. So, I mean, it, the wiring that they supply for these puck lightings, I think is like 26 gauge or something. It's slightly thicker than a couple hairs. So all 12 volt LED stuff. And I think all of these pucks are labeled and marketed as under cabinet lights. So they, 
you know, the only hole you have to drill is just big enough for the wire to go through. And then it's either adhesive or two tiny little wood screws to hold the base of the puck on. So super usable, user-friendly. I mean, honestly, I would say even if you have pretty minimal electrical experience, wiring 12 volt is a pretty good place to start with it. Disclaimer, don't put junctions or connections in your walls. As long as you know that that's a rule, I'd say 12 volt is a really safe place for anybody to even jump into the world of understanding electrical wiring because the, the stakes are pretty low. As long as it's only solid wires in the wall and all of your connections are happening in your boxes and at the surface where you can see them and get at them, it's, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Yeah, so for the fridge, that was a learning process for me. I mean, I inherited it secondhand and out of a whim, I decided to go online and download the uh, owner's manual. And thank goodness I did because the installation of the dual fuel fridges is pretty essential. They, if you don't know, they use propane to heat up a refrigerant, which causes a heat transfer. And that's how they create the cold. So it's actually using a flame to make your fridge cold. Therefore it needs an appropriate amount of space. So that way it doesn't get anything too hot and it also needs a proper amount of ventilation so that way the airflow can circulate in the back of the fridge that was a learning curve for me but um, luckily the resources are always there especially in the age of downloaded pdfs and yeah i just learned the rules and then followed them and it worked out pretty well again we're super fortunate with this fridge because it's enormous and expensive and it was free but we've had We've never had a storage issue with it because it's downright enormous. It's the size of a large apartment fridge or probably the average household fridge that isn't a luxury fridge. It's spectacular. I mean, we, we talked about everything from running an only electric unit to only doing a cooler to doing a tiny little cube because they're much more readily available recycled from older rvs and um, we never would have settled on this if it hadn't found us because it's just amazing some people have this uh this perspective with tiny home living that they want to live in a tiny home, but they don't want to make a tiny home sacrifice. So they still insist on this big full wingspan, spin around space room for activities as Will Farrell would put it. But being from the East Coast and working in the marine industry, I don't see boats that have big spaces for activity unless they've already covered all their other bases. And if you go in a 20 to 40 foot uh, sailboat or motor yacht even, and you look at how it's laid out, there isn't a ton of open floor space. It's all storage and appliances and, you know, useful intention driven design. So that's sort of what I wanted to model. You know, people will say horrible things about galley style kitchens, but the reality is, is, you know, inch for inch and foot for foot, there isn't a better solution than a galley kitchen. It's, the most economical space design for getting all of your necessities for a kitchen into a small space. You just have to. So, I mean, we tried to think about doing um, a jut out island and then doing like a dinette, uh, like doing two benches in the back with a fold down table for guests. And I guess this is a good point to mention. I built and designed this entire uh, thing in CAD before I built it in real life. So everything was built to scale. And then, you know, once I had drafted in all the framing, then I drafted all of the appliances that I knew I had to use and just sort of shoved them into the space to give me some perspective. And then just started shuffling them around. And it was probably a couple months while we were in, in the end of like sheathing and roofing where we were really heavily trying to nail down how our layout was gonna work on the inside and having it in CAD and being able to put the stove there and put the futon there and put the fridge there and see what kind of spaces that created around it was invaluable. Also a basic build without blueprints is feasible, but as soon as you add, you know, multiple layers and, you know, a challenging uh, platform, 
you imagine things are going to connect perfectly together like you want them to in your brain. But the reality is, is one's up here and one's down there. And if you don't know that until you're putting it together, that's going to be roadblocks. And if you can be drafting it ahead of time and you can see that and you can account for it or adjust it before you make that commitment. I mean, I didn't know how tall, how, I didn't know what any of these dimensions had to be until I started laying it out with what I knew the exterior was allowed to be. And then they all just started dictating themselves and it helps encourage square. You're never measuring a span to see how big of a piece of wood you need to cut. You click and drag on CAD and it tells you how long it's supposed to be. So if you're already an eighth of an inch short, it's going to push it back out to square. It's not going to accentuate your, your loss. So yeah, that was one of the best decisions that we made in the process was I taught myself SketchUp and then I used it to build this and I would never do it any other way. Yeah, so living room area, we have some uh, bookshelf space because books are super important, especially in uh, off grid. We're not big TV watchers in general. So with, we, we watch a little Netflix disclaimer, but you know, we, we don't even own a TV. So yeah, having good reading material is essential to cozying up in a space like this. And then storage, it's all about storage everywhere. You know, this is again, a, a slightly unfinished. There's, there's going to be a, a top there with an armrest on it for the futon. It's actually just a sub panel. I have a whole bunch of sub panels wired throughout the whole house in the different rooms, if you will, just to control lighting and supply 12 volt plugs. So like, it doesn't make sense to go from a battery, invert it to 110, then plug in a cell phone charger and convert it back to 3.6 volts just to charge your cell phone. There's so much energy wasted in there. So we just ran straight 12 volt to all the different locations with a large gauge wire and then put cigarette lighter plug in units and some USBs. So you're charging your iPad and your phone and all of my Bluetooth speakers and all that stuff is getting charged right off the 12 volt system without even turning on the 110. So that's just for accessibility. So this is ceiling lights for the living room. And then it's a series of resettable breakers just for the different circuits that are accessed there. And then a 12 volt and a 110. Trying to cover all the bases. If you've got somebody sleeping over and they're staying on the futon, they probably want to be able to re charge their laptop and their cell phone. So you give them both those things. This is the futon from the RV and uh, it's amazing. It's pretty lightweight. It's super comfortable, which I don't say often about things like futons. The biggest problem was a coach was huge. So where it was mounted, there was like 14 inches of dead space behind the futon where nothing was and nothing could be because that space needed to exist for the futon to fold down into a bed. So that was, that was my biggest and only hang up with the futon was that, it, I mean, if you imagine what 14 inches looks like in this environment, it, we don't have a walkway anymore. That's, you're down to under a foot. So that would have been detrimental to the point of throwing it out of the, of the equation. So I removed the base that it came with and I built a new base and I framed it with, um, with steel angle iron. And I just fabricated a rudimentary set of sliding uh, tracks. So it's, it's nesting angle iron on top of each other with a slot in one to attach them. And I mean, I guess we can probably see it. So it's just, it's square stock with angle iron over the top that slides. Yeah, there's a huge amount of storage under here. I mean, storage is the name of the game and organized storage is how you win that game. So everything was either designed for a container or we just got fortunate and found really awesome containers that fit into everywhere and, and make it all modular, removable, adjustable accessible storage. If it's not convenient, you won't do it and you have to do it here. So cooking area, we didn't really want to make any sacrifices. So we went with a, a full four burner apartment stove. It's uh, 
It's a vintage one that we got from a friend who had it sitting unused in their basement kitchenette. And uh, I was like, you know where that would fit perfect. So that was, that was great. It's a natural gas stove, not an LP stove. And they don't make a rejet kit for it. So I was curious how that was going to work out. And it seems to be fine. The, your metering is a little bit more touchy. Instead of using the whole range of the knob to adjust it, maybe half of the knob is like full force. And then the bottom half is where your adjustment happens. So it's a little bit touchier, but works great. And again, something that already existed and wasn't being used and negated us having to purchase something else new and expensive and you know recently manufactured and taking up more resources i think this is a 1956 it's a clone of a sears roebuck stove so it's the same thing with a different brand name on it but i, I looked up the serial numbers it's from 1956 so if you go home and look at your stove and imagining it in 70 years i doubt anybody's going to be doing anything with it <laughs> yeah, so the countertops are a perfect example of the aforementioned Brazilian cherry. Um, this is all Brazilian cherry flooring that, again, I ripped the tongue and the groove off of. Then I planed the top and the bottom, and then I put it on its side, and I glued them all together and clamped them all down. And then I spent an exorbitant amount of time sanding them all down to level afterwards. But um, I actually, you know, it's all part of the story, but I, I got that granite countertop from those people when I went to the, to the full house pre-demolition sale. And I thought I was going to put a granite countertop in. And everybody's like, oh, the weight. Well, yes, the weight. But that is even why I decided not to do it. It literally came down to the fact that I was going to have to pay somebody else to work the granite. I wanted an undermounted sink and I wanted, you know, radius corners and I didn't have the skills and the resources to do that. So I was gonna have to pay somebody else and that was gonna increase my budget. So I sold the granite at a profit <laughs> and then made my own countertops because I work with wood and I could cut out the sink and I could router it all and I could build it all with wood and use materials that I already had as well. So the tiles were just another um, Craigslist find. You know, somebody posted that they had just bought a house in central Denver that was owned by a wood hoarder. And literally their line was $25 for a full truckload. So yeah, I thought it was a joke when he said $25 per truckload and I couldn't imagine that there would be that many truckloads of wood or that many truckloads of wood that people would actually want. And boy, was I wrong. It was probably 10 or 12,000 square feet of shop space that was stacked two, three, and four levels of wood deep around every perimeter of every room. It was like six foot deep of wood in some places just stacked up. The only problem was that it was just intensely overwhelming. Um, there was a pallet of these tiles and they didn't really want to give them up, but I think that they were realizing they were gonna to have to give up a lot more than they wanted to because they needed to get rid of all this stuff. So I got two cases of that tile and uh, man, a ton of other stuff, all the trim around the windows, that mahogany. I got six bundles of that mahogany trim as part of my $25 truckload along with the tile and probably 50 or 60 other pieces of trim and molding and corner round and quarter round and half round and just crazy amounts of stuff that this previous gentleman had collected. It's out there. It's just out there and it's not being used in, in the current market. Not that many people want that stuff. People would prefer to have rounded textured sheetrock corners in their house than a beautiful mahogany trim piece, which is perplexing to me. I guess I see the value of that aesthetic, but it does almost nothing to me compared to the warm richness of wood. The sink half of the kitchen, a couple really important factors that we wanted to have covered over here. We wanted to maximize our counter space, even though it's pretty small. So we did inlaid cutting boards over the sink 
excuse me, so if you're not actually using the sink, this can be converted to additional countertop space, whether it's for non-kitchen related items or for more prep work. Whatever you need, you need it to be there to be. So that was really important to us. Another really important one was drinking water. I've lived on enough boats and been in enough campers and RVs to know that you do not want to drink the water out of a potable clean water tank on any of those things. It's just maybe the day you buy it, sure. But I guarantee you after your first year of putting non-toxic antifreeze winterizer in there, it's never going to taste the same. So that was just something I knew going into it and we had to come up with a solution. So I have a separate um, copper supplied drinking water system here. Where, so there's a five gallon drinking water reservoir underneath of the sink that's just the blue refillable water jugs. And then a little pressure activated 12 volt pump, like a little tiny baby thing, smaller than your cell phone, that supplies that. So it senses pressure and when you open the valve, it just turns on and pumps and supplies you fresh filtered you know, spring water if that's what you want to be drinking. Yeah, so no black water tank because nobody should have to deal with that, not even your enemies. But I have a 35 gallon clear water tank and a 35 gallon gray water tank. And those sizes were really just dictated based on the size of the bays that were created by framing my deck in and just where I could fit them underneath. So. I could have gone bigger maybe if I had wanted to sacrifice like the under the futon space, but I wanted to keep water weight low and I'm okay with even toting a couple extra five gallon jugs and topping myself off in a boondocking situation as opposed to giving up that valuable space forever. So that, that was sort of our decision. And again, with no black water, it's fairly easy to find a suitable location to get rid of gray water, especially if you're using responsible cleaners and stuff like that all the way through you can know that even you know even a rainwater drain is probably okay yeah i think that it's it's totally adequate i mean yes could it be bigger of course it could have a hundred square foot island but uh that's not what we're going for and yeah having two distinct uh spots so you know my fiance and i can both be prepping or one can be doing dishes while one's prepping and then still both have access to the stove. You get close with anybody you're living in a tiny house with, that's just undeniable. And you're gonna be squeezing past each other, but it hasn't been inconvenient. And I think that it's, it's really, if anything, the one thing I can say is it's grown us closer together. I mean, our communication, like maybe in a, our old kitchen, if I was in the middle of doing something and she bumped into me while she's trying to get to where she's going, it would maybe have some minimal level of negative impact of like, well, why did you bump into me? Why couldn't you just go around me? But once you let go of that and you embrace the fact that it's an intimate environment and you're just gonna be you know, intimately interacting with whoever you're sharing that with, it's rewarding. It, you know, it, it warms you when you glance past each other in passing. And you know, as I walk behind her, I can put my hand on her hip and, assert, and, and show her that I'm there as I squeeze by. And our, our physical interaction has gone up and our relationship has gotten stronger and healthier because we're forced to communicate and interact. And you can't really just march off and go isolate yourself in some other corner of the house and pout. You're here and I'm here and we're here together and 15 feet the other way is as far away as you can get, especially if it's raining or cold out. So yeah, you're forced to deal with it and maybe talk about why you're upset in the first place as opposed to just let it go. So the, the cabinetry, again, pretty much everything is reclaimed and it's kind of a broken record with the Brazilian cherry. You know, all of the panels on all of this uh, cabinetry are all built out of Brazilian cherry that I ripped and planed and panel glued up together. So you can see there's actually stripes in there. And then the birch that's around it is from the same house. And it was, the, you know, this was the floor and then the birch was the curtain valances around the windows and over to cover all the hardware for the sliding closet doors. So it was one by six birch everywhere as well. And that's also what the stripe is in the Brazilian cherry on the countertop. And then 
the drawers themselves, so it's all solid wood um, carcass construction, all of these cabinets that I built myself with incredible uh, generosity and guidance from Scott Rickers, uh, Coal Creek uh, Wood and Iron Works in Ridgeway. He's the man and he, I studied with him and I helped him and he helped me way more than I helped him. Um, but he showed me how to do a lot of things I didn't know how to do and helped me put all these high-end wood materials to use and we created a lifelong relationship in the process. So that was, that was amazing. All of these drawers are also solid wood construction. So they're built with Brazilian cherry and, and they're box joined with joinery at the ends. And then I opted for a solid wood slide that I manufactured myself as opposed to buying drawer slides because I wanted full depth. So if you actually look at this, the back of this drawer touches the wall inside. So there's no dead space. There's no wasted space at all. I made them to the size that I had. And yeah, also the, so it's lower profile to do the wood slides. It's less expensive and it's easier to customize. They lock all the way out so they won't slide out on you. Then they slide in and then they drop down. So you, they won't slide out during travel. You have to lift them up. This is all mahogany. So it's, pretty hard wood on wood. The only maintenance you ever have to do is add a nice little thin layer of beeswax again to reduce the friction when it starts to wear away. But I think I'm three years in now and they still slide like a charm. So not too mad about that. Just uh, pull out trash here. Yeah, trash is a thing. We also have a lab hound who will get in it if he can get in it. So it couldn't have just been a countertop waste basket or a little tuck away. It had to be something secure. So yeah, we also have um, a full, you know, RV style power supply panel. So that is a bunch of different uh, breakers for my 12 volt systems. It's also a couple of the, a couple 110 breakers to distribute that power. And then it also has a 12 volt battery charger in it. So when I'm on shore power and not out on the road, I can just plug into this power supply. It supplies the 110 to all of the plugs so I don't have to use the inverter and it trickle charges my batteries all the time so they stay topped off. I just have deep cycle marine AGM batteries right now. I think it's 208 amp hours or something. Yeah, but not a ton and again, you know, keeping everything 12 volt and not having to jump between voltages helps make that last. I can go over a week easy, full operation, taking showers, lights, fans, whatever we need to do on those 200 amp hours. And then, yeah, we have a, a big bump out bay window, which is probably the most admired and commented on single, uh, maybe besides the truck. The truck and the bay window are probably the thing that people like the most about the whole build. But I definitely agree that the bay window had an enormous impact on the feeling of this space and adding another six or eight square feet, both, you know, partial use and mentally, it, it's huge. And the natural light that it brings in and the airflow, I would do it again every single time. And the bay window is also a Craigslist freebie as a response of the Craigslist wanted ad that we posted. A guy in Boulder just called and said, hey, my wife doesn't like our bay window. We just put it in four years ago, but she thinks it's dated and wants to do something more square and modern to the ground. So they pulled it out in a whole piece. They gave me the custom made shades for it and everything. And in a ridiculous sight, I strapped it to the roof of my, at the time, she's my fiance now, but my girlfriend's Subaru Outback. Two six foot two by fours across the roof racks. And then that sitting on top of the six foot two by fours. So it hung out over a foot on either side of the car. Got to get it when you can get it. Exactly. When people are giving stuff away for free, they don't really want to wait for your schedule. That's definitely part of it. Get they it while you can. Get it while you can. It'll either be gone or they won't want to give it away tomorrow. So get it. And underneath of the bay window on the outside which we'll touch on when we're out there is like my utility area so that's where batteries and propane and all that stuff are addressed as well so the space is totally used so yeah this is the living area where we spend a lot of our time but 
let's go take a look at the bedroom loft area because that's the other half of that. So yeah, just uh, sort of the whole story. This is a, a bread knife that I made as well during the build of the tiny house from, you know, reclaimed materials that I was working with both on this project and with the, uh, with the furniture maker that I was working with. Completely handmade and definitely exemplifies the, the style and vibe of the tiny house. Okay, so we're up in the loft and uh, one of the first things that you can see that was completely essential to me is I wanted to be able to sit up full height. I didn't want to be crouched over. I didn't want to be crawling around and shimmying. I, you know, we've always imagined this as a, as a long-term solution. So simply down to the fact of how are we both going to be able to get out independently to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night without disturbing the other person? Those are the kind of things we wanted to consider. We didn't want it to be a life full of sacrifices. We wanted it to be a freeing life. So you have to think about all the details to make that work. So yeah, full ceiling height here. Also a good time to notice that all of the uh, roof framing is done out of cedar. A, it's beautiful. And I knew that I wanted to leave it exposed as a as an accent and B it's extremely light for its strength. So, you know, like early planes were made out of cedar and balsa because they were so light for how strong they were. And that's sort of what I was going for. I didn't want to put any more weight up at the top end of this build than I needed to. And there's lots of other places where I wasn't willing to sacrifice things like that, like my heavy gauge standing steel roof. But this was a place where I could with a, you know, it wasn't even really a sacrifice. It was just a design decision. So another Craigslist, this was an early one before I had any ads up or anything. This guy was, had just bought a house and I guess the people were growing cannabis in it before he bought it. So like every room in the house had floor to ceiling, rigid foam insulation on the walls. So he had pulled it all out and there was a stack of four by eight sheets that was about nine and a half feet tall. And he had it on Craigslist for $50, which two of those sheets cost $50 by themselves. And there was, I think there was 48 sheets in total when it was all was said and done. It was the first thing I bought for the entire tiny house. I had the truck, but I still had the flatbed on the back of the truck. And I used the truck to go pick up the insulation from this guy and load it into the truck and then bring it home before I pulled the stake bed off and then proceeded to use it for all of the insulation for the entire project. Cost me $50. The walls are two by six framed. It's a wood stick frame, so it's not the lightest thing in the world, but I just know it's structural and it's what I had access to and experience working with. So that's five and a half inches of rigid foam, which I think is in the low R40s, which is almost unheard of for a wall insulation. And then it's two by 10 cedar. So there's, again, I think there's like six and a half or seven inches of rigid foam in there with a ridge vent. It's soft vented, everything proper. I think that's in the forties as well, which is a little bit more of a traditional ceiling or roof insulation. It's not as excessive, but the walls are more than most anybody would ever do. That being said, stays cool all day in the summertime, stays warm all the time in the winter time. I mean, we, we've never had to live in it in the winter time in a boondock situation. So the only way I've ever heated it is with like a really small electric space heater, like one of the little 1500 watt cube ones. And you have to keep it on low <laughs> because it will cook this place out. It's so efficient. Yeah, there's a ton of built-in storage up here. I mean, storage, storage, storage is the name of the game. We knew that we wanted to have a legitimate amount of clothing storage. We also knew that we're both prone to having a pretty stacked bedside table. And we wanted to make sure that again, if you don't account for it, it's going to be a problem. You don't just magically not need all the things that you need in your life. You just have to adapt and adjust and figure out how you're going to make that work with a different living situation. So yeah, we call these our bedside tables. This is my fiance side. She's a little bit shorter than me, so she can handle the slightly slower, uh, slightly lower ceiling from the roof pitch. And then it's all, this is all, uh, a yeah, hardwood glue up that I did. So let's see, I think it's birch, black walnut, mahogany, birch, mahogany, black walnut, teak is in that glue up. And it's all hinged into sections. 
So there's three storage compartments in here. There's also 12 volt outlet down here at the foot of the bed. So we have a 12 volt fan to give us a little cooling power uh, at night while we're sleeping. You, you can also use it for some other stuff. It can be pretty handy. And then two more flip up uh, panels up here for more storage, one and two. This compartment also has 12 volt cigarette lighter plug in and a 110 wall outlet in it as well with a little notch so you can run your wires. And my fiance can put her cell phone right up here to charge and keep these down. This part's stable, so cell phone and a cup of water can live there or water can go down there. But yeah, again, think about what how your daily life works and what you think, what you use every day. Nothing that's in that category is something you shouldn't address. If you drink a glass, if you have a glass of water on your bedside table every night, where is your glass of water gonna go in your tiny home? Because otherwise you're just gonna be spilling a glass of water every night on your bed. That's, that's the alternative. <laughs> okay, so then this side, I guess we'll start up here at the front. This is my bedside table, <laughs> this area. I have a really cool wooden machinist uh, toolbox that's full of all my, I call it my treasure chest. It's full of all my like trinkets and my valuable stuff, important stuff. So that nests right in there, but it also hinges up here and I have a 12 volt plug in here as well. So we can each independently be charging our own cell phones. They're on our own sides, place to rest it, place for water, place for my change cup. You know, that's the one for me. I need a place to dump the change out of my pocket every day when I get home from work. Change cup goes up here. So then next we have um, a built-in section here. This is mostly for socks, underwear, you know, some hats, things like that. They go in here and they slide in. There's some, there's a whole series, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a whole series of the like, folding fabric Ikea boxes that come in a million different dimensions. And they're really handy because they're modular storage, but if you're not using them, you unzip the bottom and then they fold flat and you can put them away somewhere else. So all of these fit either, you know, all these thin ones fit a 20 by four inch by 20 inch Ikea tray that you can load all your socks or underwear into, roll them all up and then slide it in. So these three are that. And then this is a taller one that fits, I think, I think it fits four of the Ikea shoebox boxes in here, if I remember correctly. So yeah, for a small little set of cabinets, my fiance and I fit all of our socks, all of our underwear, all, you know, all of her beanies, some of my dread hats, like everything fits in there and it eats it all up. So this is a, a double channel uh, sliding pocket door system. Like most of the other stuff in here, there's maybe a commercially available solution but I just went ahead and made it up myself <laughs> to make it work for me. And yeah, they, they nest pretty nicely, double wide, and then they overlap to cover everything up. And then you can just lift them up and take them out if you decided that your living style was better off not having the wall there at all. So then we have clothes rod at the top. And then again, this is designed so the 13 by 13 by 13 Ikea collapsible cube boxes fit all in here. We can put our folded pants and folded shirts and all that stuff on the bottom. It like, it sort of impacts the hanging clothes because they don't get a full hang where you put the boxes, but it's not a big deal. Yeah, the world keeps turning indeed and the clothes are still there. Maybe the last thing to talk about in here is the bed because beds are super important and people tell you that every day and getting a good night's sleep is hyper important. And I didn't even want a mattress on the plywood. To me, that wasn't a good enough solution. I wanted some level of foundation and I wanted support. And boom, again, Ikea came to the rescue. So this is a seven inch extra firm Ikea memory foam mattress. I think it costs $300, super competitive for how comfortable and amazing it is. And then it's on a super low profile foundation. It's definitely a tiny house essential in my mind. It's actually built out of arched plywood suspension with rubber isolation on the edges. And then there's two different durometers of rubber 
to support you differently. So your hips and your shoulders have a softer durometer. So those ones sink in more and then it's divided in the middle. So it's actually two twins bolted together, which is also essential because my tossing and turning doesn't translate to the other half of the bed bouncing around. And this is, I think it's eight and a half or nine inches thick mattress and foundation when most mattresses are nine to 10 inches thick. Yeah, so that pretty much wraps up uh, the inside of the tiny house, but let's take a look at what this thing's made of on the outside. All right, so we're on the outside of Bertha here and uh, there's a couple cool things to go over. This is a knotty alder door that I bought reclaimed uh, for I think 50 bucks, something like that. And then I ripped a couple inches off the top and ripped a couple inches off the bottom to make it my size. And then I uh, ran a 15 degree back bevel on it and turned it into my own Dutch door. Um, with limited window spaces, we thought it was pretty important to maximize the number of openings that we had. And on a hot day in the afternoon, or if you need to kick on the oven or something like that, just being able to open up and vent out a small space is super valuable. So yeah, Dutch door. The other uh, benefit of it is, is you can decide whether you want dogs inside or outside of the tiny house and enforce that because <laughs> otherwise they do what they want to do. Um, it's all cedar one by four trimmed and then it's all cedar one by eight lap sided. All the trim was seconds from a friend of mine who works at a deck and a fence supply company. And then all of the siding was yet again, another Craigslist score. I believe I paid 25 cents a linear foot for this cedar lap siding. And if you were to go price it, I'm pretty sure it's upwards of $4 a linear foot to buy it. Not a square foot even, a linear foot. So it's more than $4 a square foot. And I think I gave the guy 60 bucks for the two truckloads that we had to go back. It was in Canyon City and uh, I had to go down there twice to get it all. He was aging out and he had built his own house and done everything himself and every two years religiously he would build custom scaffolding and reapply diligently his stain to the outside of his whole house and he was in his 60s and I think he had had a, either a, a not so serious fall or a really close call the last time he had done it and he wasn't into it anymore so he paid a contractor to pull it off and stucco it all so then it was just so I think, I think it was 30 years old when I bought it. But again, with a, with a wood like cedar, as long as it's finished and protected on the outside, it's only ever the exterior finish that's degrading. And as long as you don't let that go and let it get into the cedar, the cedar is good for a very, very long time. So yeah, one man's trash is seriously a tiny house builder's treasures all the way around. We have venting here as we touched on inside this is for the refrigerator so there's a an air space behind the refrigerator and then there's an upper and a lower vent so that way you get a conductive flow from the heat and it can always be pulling fresh air in at the bottom where the flame is and expelling the hot air at the top so that's just a little overhang like a little awning I have a Sunsetter retractable RV style awning that I have some level of intention of putting on it, but I just, it was sort of do last thing. But then like winter came while I was building it and without a gutter system, like snow would melt off the roof and it would build up in this treacherous little ridge right below my bottom step. And I almost went over backwards and hit my head on my own cherry steps, which would have been like getting shot with your own gun. So I just fashioned that as a, a quick solution to deflect the rain and snow and give you a way to open the door and you know to get in and out without um, getting soaking wet. Yeah, there's a standing seam metal roof on top, so there are no exposed fasteners. You know, so in the in the roof game, that's qualified as a 50 plus year roof. There's there's no rubber that's gonna degrade and uh, there's no cracks for expansion and contraction to happen. So pretty much a bulletproof waterproof roof. And actually 
through the goal of reclaimed recycled materials, I befriended a roofing and uh, metal roofing and siding uh, sales guy. And we worked through a whole bunch of different routes from, well, it's this price if it can be any color I want. And he was gonna give me a whole bunch of shorts. And then my comeback was, well, how about if they're all earth tones? And he was like, okay, that'll be 600 bucks instead of 500 bucks. And this is all for standing seam, so that's pretty competitive. And then I saw this glint in his eyes and he said, what about that color? And he pointed up and he said, that is 16 gauge metal, which is, you know, normal roof is 20 gauge and heavy duty is 18 gauge. So it's heavy, heavy duty thickness. And it was extra runoff from a military base roof that they had done. And he just had a couple extra rolls of it. So he said, I'll make you a killer deal on the military heavy, heavy duty because nobody else wants it. And uh, that's what I got. Nothing's getting through that. All right, the back, the bay window, everybody's favorite part. Definitely a good outside aesthetic and super functional. This is uh, the home of, of the utilities. Just like you don't wanna have electrical with connections in the wall, you don't wanna have non-permanent propane connections inside of a house. The simple act of spinning and unspinning the connector from the tank creates a leak point that you aren't checking every time you connect it, and that's too much of a risk for a residential situation. So you always see on RVs and motorhomes, you see you know an externally vented separate area for propane. So that's what this is. We've got propane tank, deep cycle batteries, 3000 watt inverter, and then there's also extra plumbing in the, uh, in the house uh, propane line that comes out and underneath. So if I'm gonna be anywhere for a real extended period of time, I could roll up a 100 pound tank and connect it to the outside and I wouldn't have to be swapping out 20 pound tanks still very irregularly. I, I probably go with hot showers daily over a month on a 20 pound tank. So I'd go probably a whole winter season with heating and water off a 100 pound tank if that's what I wanted to do. But if you're off grid living and this is your cabin, that's probably what you'd wanna do. So yeah, there's a couple of utility things and one major luxury on the driver's side exterior. You know, utility wise, we have a nature's head composting toilet vent. We have our city water fill and our, our clean water tank fill. We also have our pump out for gray water. And then luxury wise, we have a, an outdoor shower. So gotta have a place to hang your towel and then a place to stand, a shower faucet, a light for nighttime showers. Nobody likes to shower in the dark. And uh, because it's a tiny home and you never know when you wanna head out, it all just tucks away. And it's all wrapped and insulated too, so I don't even have to winterize it. You, and in the winter time, if you just put the shower head in and close the door, it won't freeze up. So you can still have outdoor shower and take a winter shower if you want to. I also, maybe one of my few regrets in the whole phase one build is I maybe wish that I had a dedicated outdoor hose jack. I wish I had an actual garden hose, hose fitting tucked away somewhere here so I could run a hose to rinse, thing, rinse gear off, give a dog a wash. You know, this is good for a dog wash. But my adaptation is just that I got a brass adapter for this hose that switches it to garden hose. So I can just run a garden hose off of the shower. The other benefit of that is hot water. I have a garden hose outside with hot water, which is priceless. Yeah, so driving uh, Bertha down the road is definitely an experience. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's scary, because it isn't, but um, you, you don't get distracted too easily. It's a, a pretty focused uh, activity. But I'd say anybody who's ever driven an old truck like this without a house on it probably knows that that's a true statement. It's bouncy, you've got some play in your steering wheel, you've got an unsynchronized transmission, so you have to double clutch between gears so you don't grind them like the good old days. But that's what makes it so great. I mean, if this thing was on a 2016 Freightliner, it would be boring. 
this is this is the meat and potatoes of uh, of the character that this thing is built on I think and as you people say every day all day they don't make them like they used to and this is a sentiment to that I mean it's solid metal everywhere it's completely mechanical there's no electronics there's no computer chips there's no relays it's literally just gas exploding inside of metal and turning a transmission it's incredibly basic but <coughs> really fun really fun to drive yeah and it's it's a 1970 international it's got 60,000 miles on it now original and it had 54 when i bought it so I put 6,000 miles on it since uh, we owned it, and almost all of those had the house on it. So she's been around a little bit. Miles per gallon would be five to seven, depending on wind in my face and how many hills I have to climb. When I originally conceived and designed uh, the layout, I thought that there was going to be a huge amount of weight on hanging over the front in that I was going to have to have these big beefy structural posts to just support that. So then I started building it and uh, I built the whole loft and I had temporary supports on here because I wanted to figure out where it was going to lay before I cut the permanents. And when it was time to build these and I had to jack up the temporaries and remove them, the whole thing just floated there on its own and these were actually an eighth of an inch shorter than the space that was left for them completely you know triangulated and uh and tied in with its own sheathing and framing so these are arguably way more aesthetic than they are functional i'm sure when i'm going down a hill at 65 on the interstate and i hit an overpass transition that it's probably good that these are here but I expected them to be, you know, totally essential and they're almost as aesthetic as they are structural. Super common question is how is your visibility affected by the Cedar 6x6s? Honestly, not at all. You know, if you take your hands and you reach them out in front of you and you make a horizon view and sort of look at what you're looking at when you're driving a car, it's all well framed within there. I mean, I only ever even notice that they're there when I'm in tight parking lot maneuvering, but they, you know, they also, they line up with where a front pillar would be on a newer car that doesn't exist because I've got a wraparound windshield. So it, it, it's essentially the same concept as do the two front pillars on your car get in the way of you driving your car? And the answer is no, it doesn't seem like at all, but everybody thinks it would. Cool guys, well, thanks so much for uh, coming on a tour through uh, Bertha, the love of our life. Yeah, and coincidentally, as you don't normally hear people say, the love of our life is currently for sale. Um, she is available and on the market for the right person. And uh, we'd love to find that person and help get us to the next step of our life. We're trying to buy some property and that's the only reason why we'd ever consider letting go of this gem is to help us get to where we need to be next. But yeah, we're looking to sell her and find a, a good loving home. Also, I'm a contractor and I do residential and commercial work. I also aspire to do more custom and fine woodworking. So if you're interested in anything like that, please feel free to contact me. My email is outdoormutt mutt at gmail.com if you have any questions or interest or just want to tell me that it's what you want to do too and then we also do have a blog we haven't updated it in quite a while but if you're interested in some of the the earlier part of the build and our mindset and the you know the story leading into it and and how it got started you can totally check that out as well that is mutt and mapes tiny and again all of this contact info you can find down below definitely let me know what you think and thank you guys for joining us <laughs>